Hi there folks, welcome back to Rich Reviews. So, what I'm going to do next here is I'm going to review a Frontline episode about, it's called The Divided States of America, and yes, it's about the events leading up to now the Trump presidency here, and now note that I have been a, I've been a fan of Frontline for many, many years, and I've always enjoyed what they've done is take a subject that most people will think, okay, we've known about this for a while, but they go, they do exhaustive research here, basically. Basically, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to lay out the events as cleanly as I can. Okay, considering that flame wars are always wonderful, I would please advise you to be respectful of any of you do comment. So, to truly understand how we got here, you have to go back to the 2008 election. Now, John McCain was looking to shake things up in his campaign and basically thought, you know, Joseph Lieberman was too obvious a choice to be a running mate. He decides to go with Sarah Palin, the governor of Alaska. And Sarah Palin was a darling of the conservative grassroots and Prairie View. A certain section loved her. The GOP establishment was, you know, clearly suspicious of her, and everyone else mocked her. Basically. Things eventually got bad towards the end of September, October, with the financial collapse, Obama clearly having inside information about what was going on, clearly seemed prepared. John McCain didn't seem to be prepared at all for this. Basically, conservatives were unhappy with the TARP thing, and quite frankly, they felt betrayed by the conservative principles that their president had laid out for them. Basically. Of course, when Obama gets into office, he decides that you know, any further punitive actions on the banks is going to be a bad thing here because clearly he wants them on their side. And, you know, he invites them to the Oval Office, says to them, okay, look, this is how it's going to go. The head of these banks are clearly relieved that they've dodged a bullet. And both the right and the left of, you know, basically say, hey, you, you bailed out Wall Street, you didn't bail out Main Street here, folks. Obama then decides to turn his attention to a stimulus bill to help revive the economy. Now, of course, Eric Hanner's interviewed here, and he says, okay, I showed him some plans that, that clearly Obama thought, okay, it was, looks interesting. Obama was then told by, Sora was told by the states, hey, look, you have sewer majorities here in the House and Senate, therefore, you really don't have to go along with the Republicans here, and that sort of has how, you know, that stimulus bill really got passed. Now, if that, with the stimulus bill out of the way, Obama could easily enjoy the next 48 years doing really utterly nothing. And, but then he decided to go that healthcare was the way to go. Now, for a while, you, you think to yourself, okay, yes, this there could be a bipartisan healthcare plan. But the way Nancy Pelosi tells it, you know, when they when Republicans first realize, okay, they're in such dispirited shapes here, they're going to oppose everything that Obama has done. Eric Cantor and some other GOP figures say, no, that's not necessarily true, that clearly we want to do health care, but we, we, we personally object to the government's role in this here. Then, of course, the Tea Party forms, largely out of the center-right part of the hatred of Wall Street here, and you all remember those, you know, town hall meetings that got really ugly, and particularly one for Chuck Grassley, who really tried, you want, you want to do health care, but then he realized, yeah, this is going to be, this basically died. And that's really the end of the Republicans' involvement with health care. Obama clearly was intent on having this pass, and so he got basically done with largely Democratic votes here. We've already formed, obviously, here with Sarah Palin sort of charging them along with talk radio. GOPers were primaried, and basically, Kevin McCarthy, now the GOP leadership, that is Kevin McCarthy, Eric Cantor, and Paul Ryan, thought to themselves, okay, we can harness this energy, and therefore we can basically get back to power. Now, of course, with Eric Cantor, it's primarily the fact that, yeah, I'm number two, my main goal is here is to be number one Speaker of the House. Now, eventually, when Republicans take back control in 2011, you know, again, Eric Cantor goes on a retreat with them. Here's what you need for leverage to get what you want to get done. And, okay, you know, the budget is a nice way to go here. But then at a meeting, Obama makes fun of Ryan's budget. Paul Ryan is there. His Obama's aides don't fully realize that Ryan would show up to this meeting. And 
Paul Ryan is the first to leave right after this meeting, and he's basically steamed, and his, the A's are somewhat horrified, because Paul Ryan thought, okay, I put out a budget, Obama will put out a budget, we'll try to mix and match here, but basically, Obama really nixed that, although, yes, eventually a budget did get passed. Flash forward to the 2012 election, and the Republicans nominated Mitt Romney. And unfortunately, this Mitt Bot 2000 is clearly defective because it's from the GOP establishment. And the Tea Party isn't happy. Of course, he nominates Paul Ryan, which eases the tension there. Also accepts the endorsement of Donald Trump, which also, why is people are clearly thinking to themselves, why is he accepting an endorsement from Donald Trump? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Now, of course, clearly Mitt Romney thought on election night that he win. That did not end up happening. Therefore, when Ted Cruz comes into the scene and is elected to the Senate, that gives that gives a jolt to the Tea Party here. They are basically saying, "Okay, it's time for a government shutdown! Hooray!" Boehner basically realizing he doesn't really have a choice in all of this. He could defy his own party and say no, but then he feared for his job and the number two guy is the one who's been egging this stuff on. And of course, then we get the government shut down, the Republicans get the blame for it, but they still get reelected in 2014 though. So all the while, Eric Kanner is fully believing to himself, okay, it's time to do something big, we've had enough of this government interference by the Tea Party, let's do something big. And it goes to the Republican autopsy of 2012, you know, that grand famous autopsy, and decides, okay, let's do immigration here, because immigration is a big thing, otherwise they, they go the way of dinosaurs. Now, of course, is it possible that immigration was going to be something that could be bipartisan in nature? Yes. Now, what killed the immigration bill? Well, let's just say that the Tea Party infiltrated Eric Cantor's district, and the people who were there simply could not believe that Eric Cantor lost. And and that was a wake-up call to all the GOP establishment to realize, yes, they could easily primary themselves. How many are in this frontline episode? Basically has probably the best line in this episode in which he said, Eric Hanner was your Labrador Retriever or thought he could hang out with a bunch of wolves. Unfortunately, the wolves ate him. <laughs> now, Eric Hanner does what a lot of congressmen do after they get defeated in re-election. They cash in as a lobbyist. So over a year later, John Boehner, clearly realizing that I've had enough of this, basically figures, okay, I'm going to be out here soon. He's, but of course, he wants to meet the Pope. He does. Then a day later, basically says, okay, I'm out of here, folks. And Vice News recently interviewed John Boehner, basically. Bernie Sanders has had a message. Donald Trump had a message. Hillary Clinton, what's the message? You know, Obama, did he have a naive of thinking to himself, okay, I'm going to come here. We're going to ease tensions between our two parties and everyone's gonna live happily ever after. Yes, he quite frankly thought to himself he would do that. But what but what truly really happened here though, and what truly really shaped his presidency, was Trayvon Martin and Ferguson. That basically destroyed any notion of a post racial America here. Partially goes back to the Jeremiah Wright thing in the two thousand eight election. He wanted to deal with this controversy but also you know try to avoid any controversy by sweeping this away. He also had that very bizarre beer summit with when Harry when Henry Louis Gates was arrested and it was like we we're all thinking even now it's like was this even necessary? Of course mass shootings kept happening and then when Newtown happened he just sort of said like okay this is gonna stop and there was a genuine effort to get a bipartisan bill through the Senate about how to have you know closed background checks and and genuinely yes there was an attempt to do this. Unfortunately, the NRA and a couple of, and talk radio and a, other organizations really struck back. And so Obama is genuinely angered by this. And, and of course, recently we got that the Charleston shooting in which, you know, one commenter basically says, you know, look, each side fully believes that they had to actively take back their America basically here because they're constantly at war with the other side. For the, for the control of America. We also get a little bit of Trump here, in which he sort of cut his teeth into the birther movement, and, you know, you clearly saw in those town halls some of the birther stuff, in which clearly the Republicans clearly did not want to deal with. 
and but they were sort of forced to deal with and you know even John McCain sort of had to deal with that stuff in the OA campaign. Anyone in this and the staffers have commented, you know, if, if McCain ever found out that you were dealing with that type of stuff, he would throw you out of the campaign. But you know, you know, it's like the other side will think to yourself that you're literally bringing about the apocalypse and so decides later in this game that figures his legacy is on the line of Trump ends up winning the presidency. Now, is there still significant disagreements between these two men? Probably, there probably is, basically, here. Hard for the, the same party to get a third term as president. All these frontline episodes, they do exhaustive research. You hear from practically everyone, from, like, on the right, from Frank Luntz, to Orrin Hatch, to Eric Cantor, to Gorver Norquist, to all these, you know, reporters, the Daily Beast, you know, the whatever else reporters I think I, I could be missing to the left, including Michael Eric Dyson's frontline's ultimate thesis that it's not it's not the same America that have voted in Obama and that has now voted in Trump. No, it's two Americas that, you know, one voted for Hillary Clinton, one voted for Donald Trump, well, at least two sides can do, can do be at war with one another. Who honestly knows? It's like, I'm hopeful for the future here, folks. So, folks, what did you think of this Frontline episode? Did you happen to like it? Did you happen to care for it all? It's, again, it's a four-hour documentary. That's really amazing. As usual, folks, like, comment, subscribe, and rich yourself of knowledge. I'll be back from vacation soon enough. I'll see you next time, folks. Yay.